Hello. Good morning, everyone. Myself, Disha Shah. Dear researchers and invited guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth international conference on information and communication technology for competitive strategies digitally on Zoom. We all are going through tough periods to fight against this COVID-19. And we are in now the second wave of this pandemic. The team ICTCS wishes you and your family to take necessary precautions. Be safe, stay healthy, and also overcome this disease as well. We Global Knowledge Research Foundation thankful to all our guests present on this digital platform to make this conference a success as the previous one. And hope you will enjoy the two days of the knowledgeful and interactive session. I would also like to mention all the presenters given eight minutes to complete their presentation. And I kindly request all presenters to tick on the specified time. Now I introduce my session chair, Annie Rajan. She is the Associate Professor in Department of Information Technology at the DC College of Arts and Science, Panji Goa. She has more than 20 years of teaching experience in the field of IT. She has presented several research papers at international conference and published several papers. Yes, madam. Welcome to the session. Thank you. Now we can start our presentation. Yes, our first presenter, Shiva. Hello, Shiva. Please unmute you. You have rights. Please unmute. Hello. Hello, Shiva. Yes. Yes, can you yes. hear me? Yes, perfect. Now you can share your screen for your presentation. My screen, uh, my screen, can you see, ma'am? No, not yet. Downside green button is the share screen. Yes, yes, yes. that's only. Hmm. Now, can you see, ma'am? Uh, wait, not yet, yes. Done. Yes, so I'll start. Done. You can start. Uh, good morning to all of you. Today I would like to present a topic on learners' performance evaluation measurement using le learning analytics in Moodle. Uh, the outcome of my presentation covers the following topics. Uh, first, research motivation and background of the study, then the research objectives, methodology, implementation and findings, conclusion, future work and references. Uh, so initially, uh, the research motivation is, uh, nowadays, most of the universities all over the world, they are using e-learning system for education. One of the most widely used e-learning uh, platform is the Moodle. Moodle uh, provides a good framework for learning, but uh, it is st static and it has some minimum functionalities. Uh, so the main uh, dr drawback of in this uh, Moodle platform is uh, it lacks a mechanism of uh, learner analytics. Uh, this helps to understand how to how the students learn in the platform, uh, and it also would help to know their behavior and preferences during their interaction with the system. Uh, 
so that's why I have taken this topic and this paper mainly focuses on the analytics of student interaction with the platform uh, after uh, making some analysis uh, to and then uh, to classify the student data based on their behavior. So the main research objectives are uh, to retrieve the student uh, behavior from the log files and the databases of the model uh, and then analyze the behavior. Uh, then after that, to classify the student uh, based on their learning style uh, using the standard uh, learning style model, which is the FS, FSLSM. Uh, after classification, we can predict the learning style for the new students automatically. Uh, the main methodology adapted is, uh, first the student login into the model. Uh, when they log in into the model, all their interactions will be captured in the log files and in the Moodle database. Uh, Moodle has around uh, 100 tables. Uh, so everything is captured in these two log files and in the Moodle database. Uh, so first uh, step is the data collection. Uh, after uh, collecting this, both this log files and Moodle database, the second step is the extraction. Uh, so we need to extract some uh, student behaviors. Uh, after the extraction, uh, then the data mining concept is applied. Uh, so before going for data mining, the data has to be pre-processed. Uh, and then the data classification and uh, prediction is done uh, using the classifier called navy base classifier. And the output, I will get a student report with uh, the learning style of each student based on their behavior. Uh, so first step is the data collection. Uh, two methods are used for collecting the data. One is the explicit method and the second one is the implicit method. Uh, for explicit method, some data are obtained from the institution software, uh, like their ID, their name, date of birth, email, phone number, uh, like nation nationalities, etc. And for implicit method, uh, two files, uh, two uh, data are used. One is the log file and the Moodle tables are used. Uh, so in the figure, I have given a sample log file, uh, which record, this is the log file, which is created automatically when the student log in into the model. Uh, their interaction are captured in their log files. Uh, so if you see this log files, the time, their full name, uh, the event, uh, the event is captured and uh, the component in that event is also captured like file, quiz, or forum, and the event uh, name, uh, the behavior in that particular event, uh, like if they view the course, then it is recorded as course viewed. Uh, suppose if they have attempted the quiz, then it is recorded as quiz attempted, uh, the discussion viewed. So uh, this is the full log file, which is, uh, which is recorded, with, uh, which records the behavior of the students automatically. So this is also used uh, for my uh, project. And the second, uh, second thing is the Moodle table is used. Uh, so there are some uh, Moodle database contains more tables. Uh, so some tables are also collected uh, for, for my project. Uh, the second step is the extracting the student behavior. So after collecting, I need to co collect some student behavior from these data. Uh, so for collecting the data, so mainly I focused on the learning style. So I want to retrieve the learning style of the students. Uh, so I used the standard model. Uh, according to this model, the learning styles are divided into four, three main dimensions. One is perception, input, and processing. So in this dimensions, again, it is divided into uh, some uh, types like uh, uh, sensitive, intuitive learners, visual learners, and each le learning style have their own behavior patterns. Uh, for example, uh, if he is a sensitive learner, means uh, the amount of uh, sp uh, time spent on a test will be more, uh, the number of revisions uh, handling in a test is more, uh, the number of performed tests will be more, number of visit and the time spent on the examples will be more. So each learning style has their own uh, behavior. So this behavior patterns, based on that behavior patterns, I have to extract from the log files and the model tables. And uh, for each learning style, they, what they prefer is also given in this uh, table. So these are the things I have to extract from the, uh, from the data which I collected from the model platform. Uh, so 
from the log files, uh, mainly the actions uh, I have retrieved uh, for each student. If uh, they attempted a quiz, uh, the, uh, uh, the actions, uh, these are the actions recorded in the log file. Uh, so these behavior patterns I have retrieved. Uh, at the same time, from the Moodle table also, according oh, to Sorry to interrupt you, Shiva. Yes, we have a time limit, so complete your okay. presentation within. Okay, minutes. so, okay, ma'am. How many minutes I have? Two minutes. Okay, okay. So, Moodle tables also, I have retrieved some data. Uh, then, uh, the data is uh, done some pre processing. Uh, so, pre processing, I have put it into three separate uh, files. Uh, uh, based on the three dimensions. And finally, the classification is performed uh, and the training is also done. So using the Navy-based classifier, uh, this uh, implementation is done in the Python. Uh, finally, I got the result like this. Uh, so here, three performance. So this um, uh, experiment is done for the 100 students. Uh, so Navy-based classifier, some performance parameters uh, I have obtained, uh, like a precision, recall, F1 square, and accuracy. Uh, for each three dimensions, the, all these parameters are uh, retrieved, and the accuracy obtained is, come, uh, is uh, written below. Uh, so for this processing, 87%. Perception, the accuracy is less, and for the input, 100, and totally I got an uh, accuracy of uh, 85%. Uh, so finally, conclusion is, uh, so just I made an analysis uh, uh, based on the student behavior and retrieved the student learning style of each student. The accuracy obtained is 80 per, 85 percentage overall. Uh, so this uh, could be used in the, uh, for, uh, uh, for the teachers mainly. Uh, so based on their learning style and their behavior, they can uh, uh, change their learning materials uh, and they can uh, change their approach also. Uh, for future work, uh, so I have limited to only a limited number of students. So in future, I can focus on more other domains also, mainly I've focused on computer science domain. Uh, so I can uh, increase the number of students and also more act behavior patterns can be extracted from the modal tables. And also I can attempt with the other standard classifiers like precision tree. Uh, so it is a good classifier that so I can attempt with other standard classifiers and I, I can use it for the predictions. Uh, so that's all. Thank you, ma'am. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Shiva. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shiva. Can I ask questions here or will we have it later? Yes, yes, you can. Shiva. Yeah. So now, Shiva, have you attended any of these Moodle modes which Moodle uh, core team conducts? Have you attended any conferences of Moodle? No, ma'am. No. Yeah, you should try to attend a conference of Moodle because they have a very good, uh, what you say, team which uh, do support you and tell you. Yes. Now, what were the level of students that you used of computer science of which class? This one is a bachelor level students. So first year, second year, third year, or first all the year. three? Yes, yes, yes. And we in our college, we are using this model. So from uh, whatever I'm teaching my students only, I have taken this data and I have analyzed. So you have 100 students in your class? I mean, uh, it is for overall semester. It's taken uh, for an entire semester. And uh, this type of analytics is not there in other uh, um, learning management system? Other learning management, I have not tried. No. Yeah, so you just check what the other learning management system, are they giving any analytics for this? Yes. And do a comparative between the two. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Shiva. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shiva. Okay, thank you. Yes, our next presenter, Priyanka. Yes, Priyanka. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Priyanka, and today I will be uh, representing uh, 
implementation of different MAP protocols for IoT application. And my co-authors are Professor Pantamina and Mari Kantan. So today's agenda, I'll be covering the problem statement, motivation, methodology, and then we we'll look into the research details and also look into the conclusion and the future scope. Uh, so we know with the current technology, the number of IoT devices are increasing and it is done by using uh, low power personal area networks. Uh, so in this research, uh, we used a physical layer of the IEEE 802.15.4 standard and the MAC protocols operating on the RDC layer. And we experimentally performed uh, the comparison between each protocol to find out the most efficient uh, uh, protocol operating in the RDC world. Uh, so uh, we know the motivation, so we know with the increased development and implementation of IoT applications, it's necessary for the protocols to be efficient and that they consume less power and energy. Uh, so that you're uh, saving uh, more time and also decreases the latency. Uh, so the methodology we followed was uh, we built a make file for each protocol and we've used a quantity operating system. And uh, we have multiple nodes which are communicating with each other using a sensitive network. And we compare each uh, node and find out which protocol is more efficient. Uh, so this is a high level block diagram. So imagine we have two nodes, one node is server and the other node is a client and the system directly communicates with the server and the server communicates to the client and the transmission happens uh, through UART. Uh, so we use MSP430, which has an inbuilt uh, UART uh, circuit. Uh, so, uh, mainly focusing on the quantity operating system, uh, it targets small IoT devices, uh, which has limited memory power and bandwidth and uh, limited processing power. It's specially uh, uh, designed uh, for uh, small uh, IoT uh, devices or sensors. And we have a Kuja simulator, uh, which is also designed for wireless sensor networks. Uh, so we have Quantiki NetSAC. Uh, so this is like a traditional OSI layer, uh, where, wherein here we have four main layers, that is network layer, MAC layer, RDC layer, and radio layer. So in the network layer, we have the routing protocol. The MAC layer, for example, has the CSMACA, which senses the channel to avoid uh, packet collision. An RDC layer, that is radio duty cycling uh, layer, has MAC protocols uh, which are used to turn on and off the radio layer. Uh, and this is a high level diagram of a Kuja simulator. Here we have the network uh, window wherein we'll have each nodes like the server and clients. And we have a mode output, uh, which gives the serial uh, interface of the nodes and the simulation control where you can stop and uh, start the simulation. So the routing protocol uh, we used was RPL. Uh, it's uh, IPv6 routing protocol for low power and lossy networks. So it has multi-point to point, traffic point to multi-point and point to point controls. Uh, so this mainly works uh, through the RPL control messages. So imagine there are two uh, node A and node B, and they want to communicate uh, with each other. So first they form a DODAG. Uh, DODAG is a uh, destination oriented direct acyclic graph. Uh, so I'm just going to say this in a way of story. Say node A says, yeah, is there any DODAG out there? So B is the existing DODAG and it has multiple nodes. And it's the parent node and it replies with a DIO, DIO uh, saying, yes, uh, there's a DODAG that exists. Please let me know if you want to join. And it sends a DIO message. Uh, so we have a DAO message that goes from the new node A to uh, the old uh, parent node B. Uh, saying, yes, I'd like to join. And uh, node B decides, okay, if it has the bandwidth, it allows the uh, node A to join its DODAG. It can either fly by S or no. So the same thing is uh, depicted using a pictorial. Uh, so we have node A, B, C, D, and E. 
uh, and uh, node A multicasts a DIO message, and if uh, the other nodes want to join, they send a DAO message. And a node A say, uh, again multicasts a DAO acknowledgement, and it assigns a rank for each node uh, based on the distance. Uh, and then the similar process happens uh, for uh, the next year where node B and C become the parent. So the second cycle happens to reduce the distance. So from D to A, the distance is more and hence it uh, is easier for D to communicate through B. So this is done based on the ranking in the previous cycle. Uh, so here uh, there is a server and client and uh, the server mainly it initializes the DAG and it sets up the UDP connection and it waits for the packets from client and it receives and then it prints them on the standout. And the UDP client it does two primary tasks that is it sets up the UDP connection and then it sends the packet to the UDP server periodically. Uh, so then we have uh, on the Mac layer the CSMA CA protocol. Uh, this is uh, used to avoid collisions. So this first initializes the number of backups, a uh, backups, a contention window, and uh, the backup exponent, and it performs a channel check. If it is idle, uh, then it reduces the contention window size, and when it becomes zero, then it allows uh, for a successful transmission. Else, it increases the number of backups and the contention window is reinitialized. So, until the number of backups doesn't exceed the maximum backups, uh, it will keep checking the channel. Else, it's a failure and it go back. It initializes the entire thing. So, in the oh, sorry to interrupt you, Priyanka. Ah, uh, yes. We have a limitation. Last one minute, your point. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so we have Quantiki uh, Mac protocol, which operates on the RDC layer. Uh, so the RDC layer mainly focuses on reducing the power consumption. Uh, so here it performs uh, three channel checks before it could transmit a data. Uh, so it will check if there's any packet coming, only then it wakes the node up, else uh, the channel is idle and the nodes are asleep. Uh, so we we have another protocol called XMAC. Uh, this transmits short preamble, uh, which has the destination address. And this uh, is received by all the nodes. Uh, so once the nodes receive this acknowledgement packet, and if it's the destination address, only then that particular node uh, receives the packet. So this saves the energy of the non-target node. So based on this, there's a CXMAC protocol, which is an improvement of XMAC. Uh, as soon as the preamble is received, except for the destination node, all the other nodes go back to sleep, uh, saving the power uh, of the listening. So the last protocol was null RDC. Uh, this was mainly used uh, for comparison. So this doesn't turn off the radio layer and it just keep consuming uh, or listening continue. Uh, so we used one server and multiple clients and this was some of the experimental results and we observed that quantity math uses the least power and energy uh, compared to uh, CX Mac or X Mac. Uh, so we did this uh, first for uh, one server 10 clients and then 20 clients, 30 clients, and 40 clients. And then uh, we observed that with the increasing number of nodes, the latency also increases. Whereas uh, for Quantiki Mac, the power and energy consumed were less uh, compared to uh, CX Mac protocol or X Mac protocol. Uh, so that's the conclusion. And uh, for the future scope, we uh, we have IEEE 802.15.4.e, and these uh, MacLayer protocols can be used for comparison uh, in multi-hop networks because they might reduce the significantly the end-to-end -end latency resulting in the lack of coordination between the wake-up moments of successive radio links along with the routes. Uh, so thank you, uh, and these are some of the references.
Uh, so thank you, and done with the presentation, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you. Anyone? Thank you, Priyanka. Anyone from the audience has a question? Hello. Yes, ma'am. You can. Any, yes, ma'am. I can. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any questions from the audience if anybody wants to ask uh, otherwise only one question to Priyanka is can you give some examples of some devices you have uh, mentioned yeah. that MSP 480 uh, so this has the inbuilt uh, UART communication and we can attach sensors to this uh, for uh, this purpose, we did a small experiment uh, using uh, LEDs uh, for blinking. So once you communicate uh, to the server, the server communicates to the client. So the system doesn't have to interrupt in between. The server takes care. So you just give instruction to the server and that is uh, being uh, sent to the client. And it, and it does save energy. Yes, it does say it. So uh, here we did, it, uh, did a comparison between four protocols. Uh, that was Contiki Mac, uh, CX Mac, X Mac, and Null RDC. Uh, so out of the four, we observed that Contiki Mac uses uh, consumes the least power and energy uh, compared to the other three uh, because of the channel check that it performs thrice. And it wakes the node up only when it's sure that there's some traffic that is coming. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, our next presenter, Ravi Shankar. Hello. Yes, ma'am. I'm just sharing it. Yeah. yeah. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, it's, it's visible. Continue. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ravi Sankar. I'm from Sida, Kolkata. And uh, this is about uh, detection of optim optimum fumigation in gain storage using fume. Fumin is a device that we have built and uh, generally we are the people, uh, means in our group, we address uh, the basic agriculture uh, and uh, that type of uh, agriculture and environment related things. So this is one of the initiative uh, uh, about the storage of uh, uh, grain. So as you all know, I think uh, uh, in India, uh, almost, uh, not only in India, in all developing country, almost uh, 25 to 50 percent of grain that has uh, been wasting uh, due to uh, the storage loss, transportation loss. So, uh, from the uh, producer, from the farmer to the consumer, like we people, uh, it, it's almost, uh, you can say, 25 to 50 percent loss we are facing each year. And uh, in last uh, uh, from uh, 2012 to 2017, almost uh, 60,000 metric tons have been wasted. So uh, uh, we really, really thought about to come up with some solution that uh, uh, this uh, paste the, uh, in the grain uh, that could be effectively killed and uh, this could be saved. So generally what they do, uh, they, they use uh, generally phosphine uh, aluminum phosphide tablet uh, that reacts with moisture and producing uh, phosphine uh, gas and uh, that is a effective uh, uh, poison to kill the pest and uh, uh, to kill the pest and insects so uh, uh, the longer I mean, uh, this is actually uh, depends on uh, the minimum gas loss uh, uh, during uh, the fumigation area, the maximum concentration uh, uh, versus time that stays. So uh, th that is actually the good quality for fum uh, fumigation. And uh, these are some photos uh, inside the FCI Kolkata building. Uh, they stores you can see here in uh, these two 
photos they, uh, how they stores and uh, uh, this is the aluminum phosphide tablet and uh, this uh, wrap up with this with a uh, plastic uh, seat uh, polypropylene seat and um, uh, cover this with the mud so uh, this is uh, actually uh, aluminum phosphide that reacts with moisture and for producing phosphine that uh, actually works and uh, uh, the fumigation dose that is the concentration versus time uh, product so suppose let's say uh, the average uh, uh, ppm uh, is uh, 600 ppm and it stays for 5 days so it's 600 into 5 into 24 72000 ppm hours so basically uh, this is not the ideal case that is a flat graph flat curve so basically what we get we, we generally get this type of uh, curve uh, so initially it's uh, starting from zero reaches up to some point then um, the effectiveness of uh, this uh, aluminum uh, uh, phosphide tablet that uh, uh, decreases and uh, generally the gas leaks or uh, the grain absorbs that one so gradually decreases and uh, this is the uh, generally the graph so basically what we tried to do we tried to uh, uh, make a device that uh, can online give you uh, the real time uh, uh, c versus t graph and uh, the uh, c versus t uh, uh, that uh, uh, number it will provide you so that you can uh, at least uh, the storage people their manager they could at least uh, understand yes I, whether i need uh, a further fumigation or this is effective uh, because as you all know phosphine is a uh, poisonous gas and uh, it is not good for those uh, labor who are uh, doing all this uh, job so we have to balance between these two that uh, uh, whether we have to give uh, further uh, fumigation or uh, not so this is the basic uh, uh, the scheme uh, that uh, from the fumigation area we have to sniff it through a micro prompt and we have to push it over the um, sensor and uh, inside uh, which is inside a gas chamber uh, and, uh, and then basically we just uh, uh, sniff it uh, and uh, uh, then a dc conversion and then we transmit it to rs485 to our computer and uh, we do the post processing so basically it says uh, uh, 7 ps3 2000 sensor from uh, uh, i think euro gas man yes uh, euro gas man and uh, we, we use a simple art mega 16 microcontroller and uh, uh, for potential start circuit we use uh, op27 uh, the precision is uh, more than enough uh, for this particular application we use parkin almer uh, micro diaphragm pump and uh, rs485 communication module so uh, fumigation uh, first of all we have to handle this uh, fumigation gas and delivery uh, this to the um, electrochemical phosphine sensor uh, that is uh, this uh, 7 ps3 2000 uh, gas sensor and uh, then uh, the signal conditioning acquisition on board digital analysis hello yes ma'am uh, sorry to interrupt you Ravi. Yes, ma'am. But you have a last one minute for your presentation. We have a time limit. So. Oh, okay, ma'am. So th this is the uh, basic uh, potential start circuit, and uh, uh, we have sensing, reference, and counter electrode, and uh, this is the basic circuit. Uh, this is the inside lab uh, testing, and uh, this is the outdoor testing uh, that was carried out. Uh, so we have, uh, I mean, so we have a copyright of you film one software which uh, that sniffs, uh, then uh, that, that pumps, they, they send the command and then uh, pumps the air, sniff, uh, then uh, return the data to the host PC, display the curve and save the data and do all this stuff. So 
let me quickly go to the result. This is the first trial result. Uh, there was a certain glitch at this time. Maybe the power failure was there in the FCI uh, Kolkata building. Maybe for uh, one or two hours. That is why this is there. And uh, this is uh, this is one of the good results that we got. Uh, uh, the trial was about uh, seven days, so it was quite effective. Uh, so we uh, contacted uh, IAFP, FPT, uh, Indian Institute of Food Processing, Tanjahur, uh, for validation uh, because they are the people who are working on this uh, type of thing. Um, they do research on these fumigation things. So they have validated this with a uh, available market, available Unifos uh, 250 uh, uh, that uh, uh, fum uh, fumigation monitor, uh, a similar type of thing, but uh, our is uh, like we can get the online result and real time things. So they experimented with uh, three, uh, one, uh, and uh, 0.5 and two, uh, 0.25 gram of uh, uh, in a specially designed chamber. And uh, they found almost accurate. Uh, this is the lab. The curve you can see uh, first three are the uh, trial without the grain, and last one is with the grain. You can see. Might you have a network problem? Yes, ma'am. Uh, might you have a network problem? Go with your conclusion, please. Your time is oh, okay. Oh, okay, ma'am. So, uh, the conclusion uh, we have we have really come up with a good product and uh, uh, that can give us a CT graph online uh, and cumulative CT product over real time and uh, third party uh, uh, calibration was um, sorry, uh, third party validation was there and uh, it shows a good result. So, the future work, uh, the manager. Uh, of the uh, stories uh, like uh, Food Corporation of India and all the, they could really use this one with the environment uh, parameter like temperature and humidity, uh, and they can study this one uh, for a good and effective uh, uh, fumigation in future. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Ravi Shankar. Uh, any of the participants have any questions to ask? Yeah, otherwise a question to Ravi is, um, since you belong to one of the good institutions like CDAC and uh, they promote such things, um, yes. what is the cost of your product? Uh, cost of our product, uh, this is within uh, 30, and um, yeah, you have said that you have used it for rice uh, uh, bag experiments, I mean rice bags. Uh, yes. And you said that the medicines, what do they keep? Uh, they are poisonous gas. So does yes. this gas any way affect the rice bags or the rice in the bags? Uh, generally, uh, traditionally, they are uh, almost everywhere they are using this uh, aluminum phosphide and methyl bromide. Uh, uh, all over I the think world. a small a small test has to be also done for what yes, is the level yes. of uh, you know this pesticides I mean these uh, things these chemicals <clears throat> affecting on these actually what we consume. Yes, yes. definitely, definitely. So it's, it's a good project, and I hope wish all best of luck, and Thank please you. promote it at a very low cost to the farmer farming community. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Ray. Thank you, Ravi. Yes, our next presenter, Sindhu Sridhar. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Um, I shall share my screen. Yes. Ma'am, is it fine if I don't enable my video? I think okay, there'll be no problem. Just share your screen. Yeah. Thanks. Please let me know when it's visible. 
it's visible then. Good morning to one and all present. Um, I'm Sindhu and um, I'm one of the co-authors of the paper titled Witter B Decoder with Configurable Constraint Length with Bit Error Correction for Satellite Communication. My co-authors are Akash Bian, who's also present in the conference, Amo KM and Professor Priyanka Agarwal. We all belong from, the P, uh, from PS uh, University and we are very lucky to be presenting, um, to be given this opportunity to present the paper at this conference. The contents that I would like to go over today are the introduction methodology, the implementation of the project, the novelty, the results obtained, conclusion and the references used. So wireless communication suffers from various forms of, uh, suffers from signal attenuation and distortion due to the noise at the receiver. And this can result in wrong data interception at the receiver. To overcome this, we use um, error correction and detection schemes to ensure end-to-end -end reliable data delivery. Uh, forward error correction schemes ensure that there is uh, good throughput and also um, eliminates uh, bit errors in the transmitted data. Two most commonly used uh, coding schemes are Reed Solomon coding, which, which processes uh, data as a block, and convolution coding, which, which processes data as a stream. So one of the disadvantages of block processing is that uh, its efficiency decreases as the block size of the data increases. So uh, that is why convolution coding, uh, encoding is, is deemed to be one of the most efficient um, coding techniques for satellite communication. And we have implemented the same. The decoding techniques uh, used at the receiver ensures that we get, we get back uh, the, the, the correct transmitted data from the satellite. Two most commonly used techniques are FANO decoding and VITAV decoding. FANO decoding is inefficient um, when it comes to the decoding rate, but VITAV decoding is, is known to have um, uh, better uh, operational speeds, efficiency, and bit error correction. And we have chosen VITAV decoding as the algorithm to be implemented. This is the methodology that uh, the paper follows. Uh, so first, uh, and, and this is the, the general outline of the Witterby decoding algorithm as well. We first initialize the state counters and registers. Then we calculate the state value using the um, incoming encoded data. Subsequently, we in, um, increment the state counter. So the state counter will only track the uh, number of states that have been passed in the uh, trelly diagram. Then uh, we, we calculate the respective path metrics, which is one of the uh, deciding factors for the uh, 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 more, most likely uh, path. And we, we choose the register that, that, that corresponds to the low, lowest path metric. And uh, uh, then, uh, so that has, that, that will be updated. And these steps are repeated until all the stages of the trelly are covered. On, on reaching the final stage, we, we will have, uh, um, number of registers uh, that, that are equal to the number of states of the trelly. That is nothing but two to the power of the constraint length minus one. So the constraint length is, um, uh, uh, it, so uh, the, the constraint length we have tried out is for seven and three, but our algorithm is scalable for any. Then we, uh, finally, we will need the uh, output in, in a serial fashion. So, uh, that is performed by, by choosing the register with the lowest path metric value and uh, outputting the data uh, serially. This is how we have implemented our project. So first uh, we Sindhu, have- Sindhu, 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 your slides, we cannot see them changing. We are still on the first slide. Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, shall I reshare? Yeah, you can reshare. Yeah. Sorry about that. Ma'am, is it visible now? Yes, it is. Yes, yes, now it's visible. And is it changing too? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, did, uh, okay, I'll just run over them. Uh, this was the introduction uh, for the paper, and this was the methodology. 
and this is our implementation. So first we have uh, divided our, our entire module into two main blocks. One we call the Viterbi node and the other is called the decoder. So uh, this entire section is the Viterbi node that is going to actually take the input data from the convolution encoder, do the arithmetic operations in terms of adding uh, the branch metric and calculating the path metric, comparing uh, and, and choosing the one with the, the, the lowest path metric value for each state. And all of, all of these are stored in, 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 in an output memory. So the next block is the B2B decoder. This is, this is only a muxing logic, which would choose the, the register with the lowest path metric value uh, based on the uh, output decoded output memory. And this is finally uh, outputted serially. And this is the setup that we used when we integrated our design with the satellite. So uh, we, we have incoming data, uh, so the, the, the data to be transmitted from the uh, satellite, which is uh, convolutionally encoded. And then we, we modulate the same, transmit it over a carrier. And at the receiver, we first demodulate it. Then we uh, decode it using our algorithm. And finally, it's monitored on the uh, computer. So the novelty of our project um, lie, lies in the following facts. First is that our, our algorithm is scalable across various constraint lengths and window sizes. So it's very easy to implement um, our algorithm with, with any constraint length or window size we want to. And we have optimized the, the time required to decode large streams of data because we perform a comparing operation at, at each state of the Chevy. Then uh, this this is uh, this has been implemented for live continuous incoming data, so it is uh, uh, it 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 is used for satellite communication henceforth, uh, and 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 we have ensured that we overcome synchronization loss due to idle channel. So I would like to explain a little more about this. So at the receiver, sometimes there are synchronization loss. Uh, when there is no incoming data from the satellite. So to avoid this, our convolution encoder um, inverts one of the uh, bit of the encoded data so that uh, the receiver never receives a continuous stream of zeros or ones. Coming to the results of our um, work carried out, this is the post layout simulation. As we can see, the Witterby output is just a delayed version of the convolution in input. Uh, convolution encoder input, uh, proving that our, our decoding um, logic is correct. The next is the uh, error correction. So um, what we have done is we have intentionally induced errors into the encoded data from the convolution encoder to test how efficiently our decoder will be able to um, eliminate continuous bit errors. And we were able to record a successful correction up to four continuous bit errors for every 35 incoming uh, bits of data. The, the, the metric 35 would, uh, sorry, the number 35 would come based on the two uh, parameters, that is constraint length seven and window size five. And uh, we can see that the rectangular blocks here uh, show the errors that have been induced. And again, we can see that Viterbi output is just a delayed version of the input that has been sent to the convolution encoder. Uh, coming to the power analysis, our, our, our design utilized the power of 37.62 milliwatt. Uh, and this has been tested using the, the Libero software. And uh, these are the timing analysis. We can see that there is a neg uh, non-negative slack distribution. This indicates that our design is also resistant to internal delays. The resource utilization are as follows. So for a constraint length of seven, we see that the resource utilization is less than 20%. Um, and, uh, and, this, and this is uh, this is for the pro ASIC uh, 3E uh, board. And for, for a constraint length of three, we see that the number of LUTs used is 95. And this is for Z board. Uh, the maximum frequency of operation is 221.9 megahertz for a constraint length of three. And one more thing that I forgot to mention before was we have implemented the um, the, the design on, on the Zing 7000 development board that, or the Z board. Uh, these are the conclusions that can be drawn from uh, 
the work uh, that we have carried out. Firstly, as mentioned before, our, our design is uh, consistently uh, um, scalable across different constraint lengths and window sizes and we have uh, we have seen efficient power and resource usage and it is ideal for satellite communication due to the following uh, reasons first we have ensured that there is no loss of synchronization when the channel is idle and we have also seen better uh, error a bit error correction when there are uh, continuous errors in the incoming data. And uh, again, since we're processing data as a stream, we, we uh, it is independent of the block size or, or in general, the volume of in, input data. These are the references that, uh, that have helped us carry out our work. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sindhu. Anybody has a question from the audience? Uh, you have said for satellite communication. Yes. Uh, basically, any specific application of which satellite communication or you will check these error rates. Bit error uh, we, we have implemented this for, for the RSAT satellite that okay. uh, on, on which the work was being carried out um, at our college. How did you get the, um, I mean, connection? I mean, how did you get uh, collaborated with them? Uh, so there's a, there's a space research uh, in our college. So uh, we got an opportunity to, to, to work with the researchers there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sindhu. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Yes, our next presenter, Surya Tipak. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Is my slide visible? Yes, it's visible. Uh, is it changing? Yeah, yeah, it's changing. Yeah. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. I am Surya from Hyderabad, Telangana. Uh, my paper uh, is uh, on ensemble methods for scientific data, a comparative study. Uh, I have worked with uh, uh, with my fellow authors, uh, Lakshmi Padmaja and uh, uh, Sri Arsha and uh, Ramna Rao for uh, this uh, comparative study. Uh, the aim of this paper is to compare how different um, traditional machine learning algorithms like SVM, random forest, can and uh, gradient boosting, adapt boost, and several other um, trading, uh, like machine learning algorithms uh, fare against uh, neural networks, uh, deep learning. So I have used uh, uh, several data sets from uh, UCI repository, uh, like uh, diabetes, blood cancer, and heart disease, lung cancer, and etc. Here we are comparing the uh, performance accuracy and computational time of uh, machine, traditional machine learning algorithms uh, with uh, uh, the deep learning and computational time also. The data sets are of uh, these. These are the data sets I have taken in these from uh, the UCI repository. And uh, uh, the each uh, data set has uh, 662 uh, uh, and uh, instead is 768. So these are the uh, descriptions. So the first step uh, in uh, finding, uh, in comparing is uh, pre-processing, where uh, we remove the nulls or impute the null values. Uh, if there is less number of uh, null values, we remove them and so that uh, there will be uh, less noise in the data. And uh, if there are more number of uh, null values in the uh, target column, uh, we impute it with uh, uh, standard deviation, mean or mode of the given uh, uh, target column. And then the next uh, columns are normalized. Uh, for example, if, the, uh, if you are having salary and uh, correlation as a uh, column feature, uh, salary has a higher value like uh, 0 to 1 lakh or 2 lakhs or maybe, uh, right? So, but uh, correlation has a smaller value like uh, 0.1 and 0.2. So, we scaled on the values uh, using the given formula like uh, x minus x max by x max minus x min. So, yeah, that is done for the whole uh, whole data set. And it is done generally on smaller data sets because uh, 
if we do it in a larger data set uh, it will take a lot of time and computation charges are more uh, and the data is split into uh, two is to three ratio and uh, uh, like i mean uh, one is to two ratio two is for training and uh, one is for testing so the uh, classifier used uh, there are two types of machine learning supervised uh, learning and unsupervised learning i have used uh, classification in this uh, learning because uh, uh, we i have taken all the binary uh, data sets uh, uh, binary data sets which have a target column as yes or no or malignant or benign uh, like that so uh, we'll uh, dive into uh, more about uh, classifier so the classifiers i used were uh, naive based classifier k nearest neighbors decision tree random forest support support vector machine ada boost and gradient boosting uh, naive based classifier is where Uh, each uh, feature is assumed to be independent of the other there is no correlation between the features and uh, kernel neighbors is very uh, it takes a toll on the uh, computational charges because it uh, by hearts every uh, training example and finds out the nearest neighbor and uh, decision tree uh, uh, uses the concept of bagging to find uh, uses uh, the information gain to find out which feature is more correlated to the uh, target variable and the iterative decision tree is on a random forest it it also uses bagging to find out uh, uh, which uh, uh, is better support vector machine uses weak learners for example uh, it trains multiple hyperplanes and to find out uh, which is the hyperplane which is better to classifies the uh, classifies the data and ada boost and gradient boosting or are, are uh, uh, boosting techniques uh, performed on decision tree and random forest so when i come to the uh, experiment and results the you can see here that random forest is uh, performing 80 with 82% accuracy in 2 2 seconds of training time and uh, in the diabetes which uh, diabetes data set with uh, features of uh, six features and uh, seven six state instances but as you see with the neural networks it is performing uh, 71 uh, accuracy percent accuracy in 10 seconds of training time Uh, see here you can see uh, uh, neural networks takes intelligently at each uh, layer but takes lot of time that, uh, that is what i am trying to prove here and uh, even in hard disk data set you can see random forest performs with 82% svm has a higher accuracy because it has a nice hyperplane but it takes lot of time 7 7 uh, seconds and as usual neural network takes uh, 11 minutes 11 seconds Uh, these are uh, th the same like uh, lung cancer uh, on the lung cancer data set random forest takes uh, 82% uh, percent, but uh, neural network takes 70 76% uh, accuracy and it takes uh, 10 seconds of time which is uh, less in this uh, right now but it will be more when the uh, data set increases so uh, this is on bl blood cancer data set and uh, random forest perform performs better and neural networks perform uh, very less uh, because uh, of the time but not of the accuracy uh, in conclusion I, i would like to say that neural networks needs a lot of data uh, to perform uh, very good uh, uh, when you when you compare to random forest and other uh, uh, bagging related concepts uh, uh, and svms uh, but neural networks uh, takes only 73% of the accuracy and uh, random forest like 82% of the accuracy in the diabetes data set and neural networks also takes a lot of time because even with uh, 59% uh, 59 uh, instances and seven features it takes 10 seconds whereas uh, 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 random forest takes only 0.4 seconds and overall i, I could say random forest uh, uh, random forest using the concepts of bagging is very good uh, because the weightedness increases the accuracy uh, and the randomness of the each uh, of the type of features taken uh, will increase the uh, accuracy of the data set and of the model and in the future i, I have used uh, uh, basic uh, hyper parameters here like for example uh, c value is equal to uh, 0.1 and number of hidden layers is equal to 128 but in the future you can fine tune or uh, uh, hyper parameter tuning can be done to uh, neural networks to increase the performance and decrease the timing and yeah thank you any question yeah thank thank you surya can you hear me yes yes no yes yes yeah yeah yes any questions from the audience 
uh, Surya, what I think is that when you're taking such critical data, like um, medical data, yes, uh, obviously time plays an important role, uh, but you should try to calculate the F scores because then you will get the true positive, false positive, true negatives. Yes, ma'am. Because accuracy does not give us that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so you should, uh, be because your data set is of that type, which is critical. Mm. Mm. Yes, and even a false, uh, I mean, thing, alarm coming as a positive is a critical situation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I think uh, you should uh, more concentrate, uh, obviously calculate accuracy, but for a better study, I think you should use an F score. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So try these methods on your data. Yes, ma'am. Well, sure, surely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Yes. Yes, thank you, Surya. Next, our presenter, Minakshi. Yes, ma'am. I'm present. Yes. Um, is my slide visible? Not yet. Did you share your screen? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, now? Yes, now it is. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Very good morning, all. Uh, myself, Minakshi Chaudhary, PhD research scholar uh, from the Department of Computer Science Engineering in International Institute of Information Technology, Nairaipur. Uh, I am going to present our work, which is entitled as Iris Presentation Attack Detection. Uh, basically, in this, uh, we have examined various Iris presentation attacks and their countermeasures for mobile devices. So, uh, this is the content of this presentation. Uh, it will start with the basic introduction of problem domain. Uh, then it will have the objective and motivation of the work. Uh, the proposed uh, framework that we have designed for iris presentation attack detection. The data sets and experimental setup that we have utilized for model assessment. The experimental outcomes, summary of the work and the reference uh, papers that uh, we have referred for this work. Now let's start with the introduction. So iris presentation attack uh, is uh, when someone presents the forged iris patterns to the iris camera or sensor to spoof or betray the iris recognition system uh, for getting access or uh, for utilizing the services of the system. Presentation attacks can be launched in three major ways, uh, either by using printed iris, which is uh, nothing but the printed copy of high resolution uh, iris image of a legitimate person and present it to the system. Synthetic iris means when uh, someone can uh, artificially generate iris kind of patterns and present it to the system. And textured contact lens means when uh, someone wears a cosmetic lens uh, which wraps the actual iris region. So by using that, a person can hide his actual identity. So by using any of these three ways, uh, a person can launch presentation attack. Now if we uh, uh, talk about the countermeasure, so uh, it is termed as iris presentation attack detection or iris PAD in short. Uh, and the applications where iris presentation attack detection is important. So we can think of uh, the airport security control in America and uh, smartphone authentication in both the cases someone can uh, uh, present the iris copy or uh, the video playing uh, iris image uh, to the system and he can take authentication so uh, with this example we can understand the necessity of iris presentation attack detection now uh, this diagram shows uh, the discrimination or in the outlook of real iris and the presentation attack samples so the first row the top row is representing real iris images and the bottom row is uh, containing the presentation attack samples. So uh, this image is uh, representing uh, the person is wearing textured contact lens and it is a printed iris image. In this person is wearing textured contact lens, but it is not a print printed image. And the third one is a printed image, but in this person is not wearing uh, textured contact lens. So uh, our ultimate goal is to differentiate between uh, these category of images from this one. So that's exactly what we are going to do. And the objective uh, behind this work is that uh, actually such kind of iris presentation attacks can be launched uh, on the 
mobile devices or in the smartphones also because uh, uh, the iris scanner that is inbuilt into such devices is not intelligent enough to discriminate between real iris and the presentation attacks therefore a pad mechanism needs to be deployed along with the iris scanner and in this paper we have proposed a learning based pad method means iris presentation attack detection method to identify attack patterns uh, by observing their pattern deviation from the real iris uh, now this is the proposed iris pad framework so if we can see here uh, we have utilized two different uh, frameworks or methods for feature extraction so uh, this is a vgg19 framework uh, and a bsif uh, method which is uh, which stands for binarized statistical image features and uh, here the vgg19 model that we are using it is a prominent deep learning based model uh, which is used in computer vision domain for uh, feature extraction and classification and uh, the bsif uh, filters that we are using are three different filters of different scales and uh, vgg19 framework is utilized for extracting features from raw iris image and uh, bsif filters are extracting features from normalized iris so this normalized iris image is constructed from this raw eye image itself by segmenting the iris region first and then uh, converting it uh, into polar coordinates by using os iris version 4.1 so these two image uh, or we can say the two different formats of the same image we are using for feature extraction and two different methods we are utilizing so definitely the features that uh, these methods will extract uh, will differ in the uh, domain or we can say the features will be in different uh, range of values so we first we we first perform concatenation of such features but after that we perform z normalization for bringing such features into a specific range of values then uh, we uh, feed this uh, uh, feature vector combined feature vector to the sum classifier for uh, classifying the given image as real iris or presentation attack so this is the overall framework and uh, vgg19 framework that we are using here uh, requires the image to be of size 224 cross 224 so uh, first we down sample the image uh, and then we feed it to the model and the bsif filters that we are using are having scales of 5 uh, cross 5 7 cross 7 17 cross 17 uh, and if if we talk about the data sets and experimental setup that we have used so uh, the proposed pad approach is evaluated on publicly uh, available data set which is live debt 2017 iris data set basically it contains four different sub data sets that is nd clarkson triple itd wvo and warso warso data set is not currently available in public domain so uh, we have utilized the rest three and in this table we have uh, demonstrated the sample distribution among these uh, data sets so um, we can see we have three three types of uh, samples live means a real iris sample printed iris images and textured iris images now uh, we can also observe that the uh, images has, uh, have already been divided into train and test sets in each of these data sets. So uh, while uh, model assessment, we, ha we have also followed the same partitioning for training and testing. And uh, these are the results uh, that we have obtained. Uh, so we can see the results are expressed in terms of APCER and BPCER. Basically, these are the error rates that we have obtained. APCER stands for attack presentation classification error rate and it uh, suggests uh, means uh, it, it represents how uh, many attack uh, samples are misclassified as real and bpcer uh, represents how many real samples are misclassified as attack so uh, the bottom line this one is representing the uh, the results that we have obtained from our method and we have compared uh, these outcomes with uh, uh, multiple state of the arts these three are uh, the win winners of uh, 2000, Live Day 2017 challenge. And these three uh, methods we have uh, referred from an existing paper. And we have compared our uh, results with uh, each of them. So we can see uh, the APCER uh, reported by our method is uh, less compared to all uh, the state of the arts uh, for all the data sets we, we can see in the results. Yes, but uh, BPCER is somewhat higher in some cases, but uh, we more focus uh, on APCER means how many attacks uh, have been classified as uh, a real because we are dealing with attacks. So uh, in that sense, our model is performing better. 
and these are the corresponding det curves that we have obtained uh, for the proposed approach for these three data set that we have taken and coming to the summary of the work so uh, we have introduced or uh, we can say we have developed the iris pad framework that can be implemented uh, just after this iris uh, scanner in the mobile device because uh, as the iris scanner captures the iris image that image can be fed to the uh, iris pad framework and it can uh, discriminate or it can identify whether the image is representing a real iris or uh, or an attack sample and uh, uh, one more important thing that uh, we we have utilized domain specific filters uh, in 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 this framework that means the vgg19 model is also trained on um, uh, iris images because we are retraining that model and uh, the bsia filters are pre trained on uh, normalized iris images that means uh, we are utilizing both domain specific or we can say iris specific filters and uh, uh, because of that we are able to construct uh, more rich discriminatory patterns between real iris and the uh, attack samples and uh, the uh, present performance comparison with the uh, other methods suggests that our method is uh, performing better so we are now able to uh, to discriminate between real iris and attack sample so this is all about my work and these are the papers that we have referred for this work thank you if you have any question you can ask yeah thank you minakshi yes ma'am i would just to like like to know what are the features which are the exact features or just tell me a few features <clears throat> ma'am uh, actually uh, as we know that whenever we store an image in the system it is basically uh, the pixel intensities so uh, wherever uh, we have some edges in the Uh, micro features of iris that edge can be a feature the corner can be a feature and uh, uh, that is represented with uh, more means higher values of pixels when we convolve a filter over that so uh, the maximum pixel values uh, are uh, constructed and that particular region or we can say those particular features are uh, uh, are converted into a feature vector so ma'am that can be a feature okay Thank you. Thank you, Minakshi. Thank you. Best of luck for your work. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Minakshi. Yes, our last presenter, Sizol Vetu. Hello. Yeah. Yes, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, let me just do this. Okay. Right. So. Yes. Yes. Um. All right. Can I begin now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. Greetings, everyone. My name is Cezole Tundovo. I'm going to be presenting this uh, work on behalf of the co-author, uh, Dr. Olakio De Oki. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Right, so uh, I'm going to be presenting a work uh, based on um, the evaluation of the effect of hardware configurations on the execution of uh, Simulink models. Now, a simulation experiment is a test on a system that tries to approximate uh, real world scenarios uh, whenever inputs are injected into the system. And then uh, according to the inputs that you inject into the system, you get your correlated meaningful outputs. So uh, simulations have been used uh, in various uh, fields and they are normally recommended when systems are still in their testing phase or they want to be upgraded because they are a cheaper option and they are a more viable option, especially if uh, adverse effects are, are, are potentially present. If maybe you want to deploy a system, for example, 
uh, in the in, in the um, army scenarios you want to check if this will be able to shoot a missile perfectly you'll be using simulations so uh, in simulations when the input variables become extremely large or the models become complex co performing that simulation experiment it may become computationally expensive or prohibitive this is a case where we we try to reduce the cost the computational cost as well as the energy cost because as um, machines do a lot of computation uh, they tend to consume a greater amount of energy therefore we deal with this issue of uh, complexity or with this issue of um, complex simulations by uh, using what you call optimized simulation simulation optimization is basically a process of finding the best input variables or the best input variables from among a lot of possibilities without explicitly evaluating each uh, variable so you don't test each and every input variable you just uh, put things on a an, an optimized system and then uh, you will obviously get an optimized result so here in our work the simulation is done uh, using a software because all simulation is done using software so we use the metric that the matlab um, software which is really the matrix laboratory software uh, that runs on hardware devices these hardware devices may have an impact on the execution of the simulated models so currently it is not clear from literature as to how hardware configurations affect the execution of simulated models in MATLAB. So this research basically aims to investigate the effect these hardware configurations have on the execution of MATLAB simulation models, uh, specifically the Simulink models, since now there is a major increase in the use of Simulink by researchers and other entities such as uh, military personnel for simulations. And um, we have uh, selected Simulink specifically in MATLAB because of the Simulink is a module in MATLAB that was uh, provide or developed by MATLAB for specific sets of simulations. We do this by uh, we do this uh, this research by simulating radar tracking models that are usually used in army environments and also measuring the time taken to execute each simulation and also uh, comparing the execution times to see which model in its optimized state uses less time for the simulation so we just used two methods in our simulation in our research uh, the first one is the literature survey uh, this involves looking at what others have done in literature in literature and of course identifying the gap seeing okay uh, not much has been done regarding the effects of hardware simulations on the effects on hardware uh, on these simulating models and also we use simulation the simulation uh, is done using two models the radar tracking model and also uh, the um, aerodynamic aerodynamic model and lastly the time is measured using an inbuilt tool in in simulink called the TikTok for actually measuring the best execution time uh, for the models. Uh, we did this obviously on hardware. We've already explained that hardware is where these um, softwares of simulation are located, and so the hardware devices have been uh, configured in this way these are the different hardware configurations that we were testing uh, these models on and so uh, upon doing the simulation and the uh, experiments we arrived at these results and conclusions that the execution time uh, as we can see on figure one this was the arrow um, model uh, which modeled um, um, 
the flight and uh, reaction of planes. Uh, it is the execution time uh, pay, uh, in, in second. It was uh, obtained using the profiler method in MetLab. As we can see um, from our previous uh, table, that the lower the achieved value, the better the performance. This means that A performs better than B, which performs better than C, and then B performs better than uh, E. This shows or this tells us that the hardware configuration has an effect on the, the execution of these uh, simulink models. As we can see that uh, the results that have been achieved, uh, that the achieved results, their clock speed is actually affected mostly by the processor type and the amount of RAM available uh, when the model is being executed. And this, of course, agrees with results from literature that have been looking at other works in other fields that uh, when they execute models on other simulation tools, RAM and also the processor, they tend to have an effect, which, is, which we have found to also be the case in this MATLAB simulator. And also, on the other model, model B, because we said we use two models, uh, the radio system model, uh, it shows also that under different um, hardware configurations, the optimization is achieved by reducing uh, the, um, the stoppage time by 0 0.2 seconds, which is a, a, a really, uh, well, in our world, it is a really small reduction, but in, computers, in computation times, uh, 0 0.2 seconds is, 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 is reasonable time. So the results presented in, in our figure two uh, show an improvement of approximately 13% to 23% after optimizing our results by reducing the time taken by 0 0.2 seconds. Thank you very much uh, for your time, your concentration. If there are any questions, I would like to take them. Hello. Stop sharing your yes. Yes, I can. Don't matter. Okay, so you was that a question? Met, yes, uh, you have used MATLAB. Is there any other uh, software which you can use for testing that if hardware there is a change, uh, there is a change in the result? Yes, you have yes. used MATLAB. Is there any other software which you have identified? Yes, there are other softwares, uh, but the, I chose MATLAB because it had the specific military uh, simulation tools that I wanted to work with. So if you wanted maybe to work with uh, other simulation and emulation uh, materials, then you or, or software then you can use other um other tools like ns2 and uh, and others ns2 ns3 you know uh packet blaster and, and all those things and all those tools oh thank you yes. thank you very much anyone else has a question can ask okay um, i think that's it yes now we're done with our all presentations. And I sincerely thank our all researchers for their excellent presentation during this session and all the participants for being a part of this international conference. Hope this session interactive, informative and knowledgeable as well. All the presenters would be getting their digital certificates, payment receipt, thank you letters through email, within one or two working day and further all the papers have already been forwarded to the springer for the publication process and the publication will be live within four to five months kindly so cooperate with the ictcs team during this time and i also thank our session chair for your valuable presence madam for chairing this session
Thank you. Here is one small token for your presentation. Session, where is the session? Wait a minute. Small token from our side. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and best wishes to you all for the remaining sessions. Then, at last, I request all of you to turn on your camera to take a quick snapshot for memories, ICTCS 2020. My camera is not working properly. Okay, no problem. Smile, please. Done. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, madam. Yeah, your thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your days and keep safe from the coronavirus. Yeah, stay safe and take care, everyone. Amen. Yes, hope you overcome with this as soon as possible. Done.